So today's talk uh, is about uh, getting away from the approximation that even when the enthalpy of mixing of fin uh, is finite, we assume that the atoms are randomly distributed to calculate the configurational entropy. And in general, that cannot be the case because if the enthalpy of mixing is finite, that means some atoms prefer to be next to particular kinds of atoms and therefore the configurational entropy cannot be random. And the sort of uh, model that I'm going to describe has a, a variety of uh, uh, hierarchies. So the regular solution model that we discussed um, is known as the zeroth order quasi-chemical model because it basically assumes a random mixing for the entropy term uh, with a finite enthalpy of mixing. And today I'll discuss the first order quasi-chemical model where we will look at pairs of atoms rather than individual atoms. And there are even higher order models where you look at clusters of atoms being distributed in your system. Okay, so just to summarize then, um, these are the characteristics of the models that we have discussed so far. The ideal solution has a random mixture of atoms and zero entropy of mixing. So the entire contribution to the free energy comes from the minus T delta SM term. And the system is said to be completely random at all temperatures. In the case of the regular solution model, uh, we assume that, uh, sorry, that should be, um, I'll just change that so that there's no confusion. So this is the regular solution model. And this is the quasi-chemical model that I'll discuss today. So in the regular solution model, we assume that the entropy of mixing is determined by a random mixture of atoms, but we admit that the entropy of mixing is not zero. And the quasi-chemical model deals with this problem where we don't assume that the entropy of mixing is ideal. Okay, so in a regular solution model, atoms are treated as independent entities uh, and it's called the zeroth order quasi-chemical model. Okay, so in the quasi-chemical approximation first order, we say atoms are not distributed at random, but pairs of atoms are treated as independent quantities, okay? Right, in order to uh, go through the derivation, I'm going to go through a very simple case uh, where we have just two energy levels. This is the ground state here, and this is a higher energy level by this uh, quantity E1. And G represents the degeneracy of states. That means at this state, I have two equivalent states with the same energy, okay? And in the ground state, I have three equivalent states with the same energy, which is zero in this case for the ground state. So the atoms will distribute themselves amongst these energy levels, depending on temperature and the quantity E1. So the number of atoms out of the total number capital N, which are in the ground state, will be the degeneracies of the ground state. The, we have these three energy levels, say, uh, divided by the total number of possibilities where this is the ground state and this is the higher energy state and the chance of occupying the higher energy state, E1 over KT. And similarly, the number in the higher energy state is given by N1 over N. Uh, which is the chance of being in the high energy state times the number of high energy states with the same energy uh, that exist. Okay, so this is straightforward. Um, and the importance of this is that it defines what we call a partition function. Okay, so this is very common in thermodynamics. A partition fu function is simply the sum of all these terms here. Uh, where again, this is the degeneracy of the ith state here, 
and the energy difference between, between the states relative to the ground state. And if I take the logarithm of this term, then if you work it out, you'll see that that gives us the free energy of the system, the Helmholtz free energy of the system. So if I take uh, the Helmholtz free energy of the system, it's minus RT log of the partition function and substitute for the partition function, then that is our partition function, G naught plus G1 into exponential E1 over KT. I, I expand that and I get this as the Helmholtz free energy. And if you want to convert this to Gibbs free energy, then you just add uh, a P pressure times a volume change term. So if I want to work out the difference in energy between the state where all the atoms are in the ground state and then at a particular temperature T, then this term disappears here. And that is our difference in the Helmholtz free energy, okay? So that is the meaning of a partition function, you know, how the atoms are distributed over the different energy states, how they are partitioned on the different energy states. And the importance of that is that we can take the logarithm of that function, multiply by RT, and we get the Helmholtz free energy term for that uh, particular system. Okay, now, if I'm looking at a system of A and B atoms, then the number of AA bonds is simply the total number of A atoms minus the number of AB bonds, because this fraction of A atoms has been, uh, this number of A atoms has been taken up in forming a bond with B, and therefore it cannot contribute to AA. And since we can't distinguish these two A atoms, there's a factor of a half here, and this is a coordination number Z. And the number of BB bonds is similarly given by the number of B atoms minus the B atoms that are occupied in forming AB bonds, which are not the same as BB bonds, okay? This is just a reminder. And we have a binding energy between the atoms, which was defined as follows. So if I take two, a atoms from a distance far apart and I bring them close together, then I get a curve like this where initially they may attract and then they start to repel as you push them closer and closer together so that the electron clouds are interfering. And the binding energy is defined as minus two AA over here. And the whole basis of the binding energy is that we want to work out the enthalpy change, uh, or in this case, an internal energy change uh, when we make a mixture of A and B atoms. So this is the total energy of our assembly or total internal energy of our assembly, where this is the binding energy, half the binding energy of the A atoms multiplied by the number of A bonds, BB, number of BB bonds and AB and the number of AB bonds where AB can be distinguished from BA. So if I just uh, simplify this, then that's uh, minus Z into this term where omega, you'll remember from a previous lecture, is when I take an AA bond and a BB bond, break them apart and form two AB bonds. So that's uh, nothing new from what we've done in calculating the enthalpy change for the um, regular solution model. Okay, now let's... Uh, Let's try and make a partition function uh, for, for a system where we have a number of energy states, okay? And here is our equation where this is the number of AB bonds, the degeneracy of states for that number of AB bonds and the internal energy for that number of AB bonds. And you know you can have a different uh, number of AB bonds depending on how the atoms are arranged. So there's a whole uh, summation here of the degeneracies of the variety of NAB values and the variety of UNAB values. And uh, I substitute for U from the previous slide and this is what we get. So GNAB 
is simply the total number of arrangements for a given value of n and b. It's the degeneracy of that state. How many states do I have, which have the, exactly the same uh, number of n and b atoms and energy? And sigma n and b, that means the total number of arrangements I can get in a mixture of n and b, is simply n factorial or n a factorial into n b factorial, as we did <clears throat> in our earlier example. Now we are going to make an approximation, okay? Uh, and the approximation is that, you know, to work out the Helmholtz free energy, you take the logarithm of the term, and that will be dominated by the maximum value of, of NAB. Okay, so we'll ignore all other terms in the summation and simply uh, take the maximum number here. And therefore, um, the degeneracy for the maximum value of NAB must be equal to this here, okay? Because we've approximated this summation by simply taking the maximum value, given that it's the logarithm of omega, which uh, gives us the free energy. So that's an approximation that we have to make in all of these quasi-chemical models uh, to make it, make it simpler. Okay, now I can write, just as we did for a random solution here, um, where this is n factorial or n a factorial and b factorial, I can write the number of possibilities for having a certain number NAB bonds in a mixture as this, which corresponds to this term here. Remember, we are dealing with pairs of atoms now, okay? Uh, and that's why we have the coordination number and the half. And similarly, we divide by the AA bonds, the BB bonds, and we distinguish between the AB and BA bonds. But the important thing I want you to notice here is that while this is an equality for a random solution, uh, this I've written as a proportionality. And, because, and that's because there's a problem in dealing with pairs of atoms that we can't count the number of AB bonds independently. Okay, and I'll illustrate that problem here. That I've got these four atoms here, A, B, B, and another B. Once I've placed this B atom next to this A atom, I've got an AB bond. And once I've placed a B atom next to this B atom, I've got a BB bond. And once I've placed this atom here, I've got a BB bond, but there's no choice here, okay? Once we've made this arrangement, this bond BA, is there. It's not independent of the counting that we are doing. So we want to treat these bonds as independent, but we can't because there's no way you can do that. So how do I change this proportionality here into an equality? Because you know, we need to do that to work out the free energy. Okay, so I hope everyone understands this, that once we have fixed these four atoms in position, the, this bond here, BA, is not independent of the configuration of the other bonds. In other words, we are not taking account really of the orientation of the bonds in the lattice in calculating the number of AB bonds. Okay, so uh, this is the number of degeneracies for the maximum value of AB bonds that we described uh, earlier. And again, we have a proportionality sign giving us the number of possible arrangements which give me this maximum value of NAB. But that must also equal this. And therefore, we can normalize the equation by dividing the top and bottom by these terms here, which are equal, okay? So I can write that the degeneracy for a particular combination of A and B atoms is given by the usual factor and a normalization factor, which converts it into an equality. Right, so that's quite a lot to take in, but the principles are straightforward so far, that 
in our partition uh, function, uh, we have simplified the problem by taking the largest number of NAB bonds, okay, and ignoring uh, the number of configurations for the largest number of NAB bonds and ignoring all others. And in this process here, because uh, we can't treat pairs of atoms as being completely independent, uh, this uh, if this was an equation, it would overestimate, okay? So what we are doing is we are normalizing uh, the general equation for the number of AB bonds by, by these, these terms here, which are equal. Just, just dividing at the bottom by this and multiplying by this, okay? Okay, so in our partition function, we've already said that we don't need this uh, summation. We are simply going to set this to the maximum value of NAB. So we don't need this summation here, uh, but we have now the complete equation. We have here the degeneracies for NAB being the maximum number of AB bonds. And given that we know the value of NAB, uh, we can work out the internal energy part of the problem. So all we have to do is differentiate this equation with respect to the number of AB bonds to find the equilibrium number of AB bonds. And when you do that, you get an equation like this, okay? Uh, where this is like a regular solution model where we have the coordination number X, uh, one minus X being, uh, you know, the a mole fraction of B atoms and mole fraction of A atoms and the total number of A atoms. This term is special, okay? So it's taking account of the fact that we have a finite enthalpy of mixing, which is given by this term omega, the difference in the binding energies. And therefore this will not be equal to the number of pairs or a number of AB pairs that you would find in a completely random solution. It will depend on this value here, okay? So if I take a plot of this, uh, this um, equation, this is how the number of AB bonds varies with our enthalpy term, okay, omega. And this is how the number of AA and BB bonds changes as a function of the enthalpy. And when we have an ideal solution, that means uh, the enthalpy term is zero, you know, these, this quantity is simply given by, you know, the probability of finding an A atom times the probability of finding a B atom and so on. And similarly, an AA is simply proportional to one minus X squared and NBB to X squared as usual. But when we have a finite enthalpy of mixing, that is no longer the case, okay? So you can do a fairly uh, rigorous calculation of the free energy using that partition function. And this is um, the Helmholtz free energy. And if you are working at uh, zero pressure, that's equal to uh, the Gibbs free energy. We take uh, the um, logarithm of the partition function this term we've already determined from the omega and the equilibrium number of bonds and this. When we expand this, we have three terms here. This is our normal enthalpy of mixing if you ignore, ignore the denominator here, okay? But this takes account of the fact that there's a finite enthalpy of mixing um, because the number of AB bonds will not be given by random probabilities. This, of course, is the ideal entropy of mixing. And this term here corrects the ideal entropy of mixing for the fact that we don't have a random mixture of atoms. Okay. Now, you might uh, ask, you know, what is the importance of this equation? Uh, you know, why can't we just use the empirical thermodynamics which were there in the thermocalc uh, and empty data and backstage and so forth where we have polynomials and so forth. There are cases uh, where you cannot do that, okay? So if you have uh, an ordered system, you cannot 
actually uh, talk about the pairs of atoms or, or atoms being distributed at random. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, when we come to, for example, the diffusion of carbon in austenite, uh, you know, the concentration dependence of the diffusion coefficient <coughs> is given partly by the fact that the chemical potential is a function of the composition. Mm -hmm. But in part, it also comes from the fact that the carbon atoms do not ever want to be in adjacent sites within the lattice because they strongly repel each other. And that's, that term comes into this, uh, this kind of a factor beta Q and provides an additional push to the carbon to diffuse down the gradient simply because the carbon atoms don't want to be next to each other. So you cannot explain the concentration dependence of carbon in austenite simply by saying that there's a thermodynamic factor which comes from the dependence of the chemical potential on concentration. These terms become important. And if you go to my website and look for a paper on the diffusion of carbon in austenite, uh, Siller and McClellan did a lot of work on this, and uh, I, I derived some coefficients for that work, and you will see that it beautifully represents the concentration dependence of the diffusion coefficient of carbon in austenite. So there are cases where we cannot uh, simply use empirical terms. The other point is that a lot of the thermodynamic data, the equilibrium thermodynamic data, will be derived at high temperatures because you cannot really achieve equilibrium if you go to sufficiently low temperatures. That means that if you try to extrapolate those functions, you might get some strange results in using uh, you know, thermodynamic databases alone. Uh, so this method also enables you to extrapolate to low temperatures. And by low temperatures, in the case of uh, um, in the case of nickel and iron, you're talking about at temperatures below about 600 degrees centigrade or lower. So uh, in, in doing our calculations on the transformation start temperatures for the non-equilibrium transformations like uh, martensite and bainite and so forth, we use quasi-chemical theory to do the extrapolations, okay? Because um, this is a, a rigorously founded theory. In as far as uh, we've now gone on to look at a non-random distribution of atoms for the configurational entropy. If you go to higher approximations of uh, quasi-chemical theory, they're generically known as cluster variation methods, okay? So this is just an introduction to quasi-chemical theory, and I'm going to summarize this now. So how to derive all these solution models? Well. First of all, we categorize and count the variety of atom-atom or atom vacancy pairs that are possible in the solution. And you know, in the case of uh, an interstitial solution, uh, the number of vacancies is of course much, much greater because uh, the vacancies are simply the holes between the atoms. So you have to explicitly take that into account. Uh, you estimate the configurational energy. That means the enthalpy term if we are working with Gibbs free energy and internal energy term if you're working with Helmholtz free energy. Then you write a, a configurational partition function, you know, basically telling you how the uh, particles are distributed along the different kinds of energies and the degeneracies of those energy levels. Discover the degeneracy for each configuration. And because we cannot strictly count pairs of atoms independently, we have to normalize that degeneracy function, okay? Uh, and replace the summation by the largest term in there. And then we derive the thermodynamic partition function and the problem is solved. Of course, there might be other terms which come, for example, from thermal entropy and so on. Now, I've talked for approximately um, I would say 20 minutes, okay? Uh, or, or 15 or 20 minutes. But the concepts here are actually quite powerful and you actually need to uh, do something with chemical theory 
to understand its full power. And I don't need to go into any more complexity beyond what I've taught you, because the idea is simply to know that there exists a method which can take account of non-ideal configurational entropy, all right? So that's the important takeaway from this. So if someday you come across a problem where you need to treat a solution with a non-ideal configurational entropy of mixing, this is the way to do it. And to be honest, you know, uh, all this talk about high entropy alloys, which I uh, mentioned in my very first lecture, it's remarkable that they all assume the ideal entropy of mixing, whereas it is simply impossible in that sort of an alloy system to get an ideal entropy of mixing. Okay, so someone needs to do uh, proper work there to see whether these are really high entropy alloys or some wishy-washy low level of entropy because the atoms are not distributed at random. So I don't want you to worry too much about the mathematics that I've presented. I want you to understand that there exist methods which enable you to work out uh, the configuration entropy in a much better way than simply assuming that the atoms are randomly mixed. And this is the end of the course. So at the end of the course, we must have a little celebration. So this is how I would like to celebrate if I was there. This is a picture that was taken at the Indian Institute of um, Technology in Karagpur. And th this actually is the first time I had this after uh, emigrating from Kenya as a child, because in Kenya, we used to have this as well, where you, you know, chop off the top of a green coconut, you drink the juice, and then you scrape off the flesh and eat it. And the sad thing is that one of these in Britain costs about 450 rupees. Okay, <laughs> so, so it's more or less uh, unaffordable. Um, so thank you all for attending the course. I have really enjoyed it. And all the videos for this uh, are on my YouTube channel if you ever want to look at them again. Okay, yep. Harry. Okay. Oh, thank you very much for this wonderful series. And it's so nice of you to, you know, have so much of time for our students and other participants. We really, you know, we are really grateful to you. And I hope in the future we should be able to do it again sometime.